there and back again a journey for virtualization and as GB already said you told you I'm the instructor trying to give my best to provide a nice overview but also a bit of in-depth information about different types of virtualization. I'm very lucky to have two amazing TAs which are Sebastian and Elizabeth and they are going to help me during the lecture in case you have questions and point them towards me. Okay. Sorry, can I address one question which has uh, been repeated a couple sure. of times? Uh, we're still uh, not finding the slides on OSF. Uh, I will put I will put the um, uh, the repo that where the slides should be on uh, in the in the chat window. So for everyone. Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, that's a good point. So I do not like decided to not. Usually, it's what I do. I do not share slides to begin with. Um, but I only share the comments we need because usually afterwards when getting feedback, I incorporate that feedback into the slides, make the slides a bit smaller in size, and then share that final version of it. That's how we're going. Don't be afraid. Um, so you will have the slides later on and all the comments you need to run, we will get them in a minute. Um, starting with the uh, objectives, your role, schedule, logistics, and good to know things for this lecture. So the objectives are that you should gain skills. That is learn about open and reproducible methods and know how to apply them using virtual, virtual environments and Python, that's for example, Conda or, and or Docker and Singularity. You should hopefully know the difference between virtualization techniques and hopefully you would also be empowered with the tools and technologies to do reproducible, scalable, and efficient research. Another hope that we have is also that you get involved in the Docker ecosystem for uh, your scientific workflow and share the whatever you learn here. Hopefully it's a lot um, back to your home institution and our lab. Your role during this lecture is to ask questions, obviously, first and foremost, and think quick and towards reproducibility. That is keep the big main goal in mind. We will further familiarize with yourself with the shell and non GUI applications, because none of the tools we're going to work with has a graphical user interface. Um, you should start thinking about how you could apply and integrate these techniques introduced here into your own research workflow. The next one, that's a bit of a stretch though. Have a great time. I hope we manage to uh, make that happen. And of course, please give us feedback and help improve the materials. Our optimistic schedule, that's why optimist, optimistic is in blue and uh, italic because it's very optimistic, is we're gonna start with an introduction and a problem statement, then check out virtualization using um, Python-based virtualization that is VN, Fanconda, then have a short break and room for discussion. Then we go to Docker, a brief introduction and basic Docker management and handling. Afterwards, short break discussion again. Then we will learn how to build our own Docker images. And then in the end, talk about some advanced concepts within the realm of um, container-based virtualization. As I said, it's a very optimistic schedule most likely we will not be able to do all of it because it is a lot. Um, if that's the case, don't worry. I am more on that side that we try to make everyone understand the things we're talking about as far as possible. And if, we don't, if that means we don't manage to do all of it, that's fine. Because as I said, after incorporating your feedback later on, you will have the slides, you will have the comments in a minute so you can like go through it again and uh, look these things up. Logistics, what your machine should have or should be able to do is get Docker up and running and pull Docker images. I know that some persons might not have Docker by now, which is not your fault, but most likely you are on Windows. I know one Mac person, we tried our best to get everyone on board with that. But I mean, we can only try so much. So if it's not working for you right now, I'm very sorry. We 
most likely already spend a lot of time trying to solve your problem. But um, this, yeah, can't really do much here. If you're not able to run Docker, you of course can follow the lecture and we will try to solve your error so that you can use it later on and then maybe try the comments in the lecture and the things you talked about yourself later on. Your machine should also have um, virtual environments and Python, VNF and Conda, which you should have given that you installed mini Conda or Anaconda or on your machine. You should know a bit about the shell, should be able to open one and type in it and run some comments, which after Ross great lecture yesterday should be no biggie. And the session may take up to 10 to 15 gigabytes of space. This space this can be deleted at the end of the lecture because we are going to create a bunch of virtual environments and then in the end, after lecture, you can delete it if you want. If you don't want to delete them, keep them. That's up to you. But it's a temporary um, space. Um, please let us know if you don't have that much space left or think you were run out of it. That's also why we said you should have at least 40 gigabytes of space left. Um, and the setup instructions. And yeah, use the communication channels, either Slack or the Zoom group chat in case there should be like there's any questions, problems, comments, what have you. Okay, and the first thing going right into it, we're gonna get the materials. And for this, I would like you to at first go somewhere on your machine where you would like the tutorials and the um, comments and the materials you're going to download to be stored. I'm just putting it on my desktop because I'm a lazy ox and I wanna easily delete it later. So just use CD, the comment you wrote yesterday to change your current working directory to wherever you would like the materials to be. And once you're there, please type git clone Yes, we will also use Git again after Elizabeth's great lecture yesterday, trying to incorporate like a lot of things here. And we use a comment called Git clone. And I think JB shared the link to the materials on GitHub in the chat. I have it open in this tab here. So you should see something like that. And if not, please navigate there. Yeah, I just did it. I uh, just uh, shared the link. Um, so uh, you should all have it now. Okay, thanks, Jibi. And if you click on it, you see, should see something like this. And if you're there, just go in the address bar. Whoop, copy all of it. Go back to your terminal and just copy paste it in here. And it should look something like that. If you were able to clone the repository that uh, Pear was uh, is showing, so that's the uh, new data science uh, slash on GitHub, new data science organization, course uh, dash uh, um, material uh, 2020, and that's, uh, so you should, uh, uh, if uh, everything is cloned, then you can uh, CD in that directory and, uh, and uh, look at the material. Uh, some of it is, uh, from yesterday, some of it is from today, uh, and you can sort of like uh, already see what, uh, uh, apart from the slides, what uh, Pear is going to, uh, uh, to demonstrate, some of it at least. If it uh, works for you, you should see something like the stuff I'm highlighting here. You rang that git clone command and then it tells you cloning into course materials, 2020, because it's the name of the repository, and then it should download um, the respective uh, content of it. So what git clone does is, it's a git command, as you might have guessed, because it's called git clone. And then cloning means that we, it's basically, um, I already told Elizabeth that she should correct me if I say something wrong here. It's like the download command of git. That is, from this repository, we're downloading everything there is, including the .git files, 
the different branches, like the whole metadata that is involved in Git. So we should now have on, on my desktop or wherever you are, you should have that folder called Cost Materials 2020. And we can check out its contents as we learned yesterday using ls for list and see we have um, two different folders, lectures and website and within lectures we have one folder or directory for each day of this week. If I'm not super mistaken, it should be the 12th of May. Therefore, we are going to cd into deck directory. And using it as we should discover that we have directories for the Python lecture that was conducted this morning and the intro to containerization. This is the lecture that we do right now. And for now, we're just gonna CD into that containerization um, directory. And if you're there, that's good. And we're gonna continue here. If something did not work for you, please let me know or us so that we can fix it right away. Okay, I see no questions popping up. Ah, sorry, that's my email popping up. That's the wrong question. Okay, and good to know, please. If you don't mind, use Netflix, Instagram, Twitch, and what other kids do these days during the breaks only. That being said, we highly encourage you to tweet about what's happening in the school as a whole, as Pierre mentioned yesterday, using the hashtag Rainhack School. Okay, folks, this is the virtualization works. And we're gonna start with the problem statement, which is, a colleague of yours wrote a super fancy DTI, diffusion tensor imaging analysis. Your PI is obviously super happy about it and wants the whole lab and research galaxy to use it. Your colleague just openly shares the script and everyone can use it. Or can they maybe not? We're going to find out. And within the new data science repository we just downloaded, you will find in the uh, interest decontinuation folder, you will find a script called fancy DTI analysis.py. And what we're going to run here is a modified version of a great tutorial from the DiPy docs, actually. And we trying to run it using the shell. That's Python. And then the name of the script function that we want to run. That is Python fancy DTI analysis.py. And then we just hit enter. Then depending on your machine and your setup and what have you, it will take a while to run. That's completely fine. That gives us also time to react to questions, if there are any. Oh yeah, a bunch of questions popping in. That's what I see. GB NTAs, anything super pressing, urgent, bigger problems? So we get, we have a couple of uh, errors. I think, uh, for instance, I got an error, no module named DiPy. 
Um, and then there's an error says, uh, no module named DiPy. So basically most people have not the DiPy module uh, installed. The DiPy package. Okay, so okay. actually within the directory should get several outputs. Some PNGs, three and one, the other K file, which I'm getting, as you can see here. And if we check them out, um, let me just quickly pull up the directory here. You should see some fancy DTI pictures. Hmm. Okay, to so tell you folks. So pair for those yeah. people who don't have the DiPy module, how does, uh, can you uh, help uh, these people? Yes. So this is what I anticipated, right? Or should I say, planned because most of all should not get results in anything. This is a intended error. And we, um, if we gather some errors here, what you be already mentioned is that most people don't have the DiPy module installed. Others that might have it for whatever reason might have different problems. Um, I hate to tell you, it works on my machine, as you saw, right? I could just run it and I get my outputs and everything is okay. And this is exactly folks is what we're going to talk about. Just sharing the script on GitHub. I mean, it's already great and the majority of people still don't do it for whatever reason, but just sharing your script and nothing else is not enough for other folks to rerun your script, your analysis, reproduce your results, what have you, it won't work in most cases. And this is the problem we are facing in neuroscience since a while now. I mean, it's not a particular neuroscience thing, but uh, we also have big problems here, um, which all started some years back with the big reproducibility crisis, saying that like all the fMRI or MRI neuroimaging results as a whole or it's not, it's not reproducible, we can't trust the results and what have you. And there are some nice follow-up investigations by uh, Tristan Gladard that will, you would also get to know later in the right next school. And he actually did a nice study called the uh, reproducibility of neuroimaging analysis across operating systems, where they compared the outputs of the same pipeline on the on same on, on identical operating systems, changing some libraries and binaries, uh, using different version of modules, like everything that you would typically have in your computing setup. And what you see is that even like small changes can lead to drastically different results that can go from maybe one or two voxels not being there to a complete non-significant or significant result or change in the significance. And what you see here in the same study is the DICE index or the DICE coefficient, which is the overlay that is how comparable results are, how identical results are. And what you can see is that if you run it on different clusters that are set up in a slightly different way, most of it has a good DICE index, but you can see there's some variability in it. And it's the same case if you run like a fixed or automatic dimension detection for these um, results. And you would expect that if you run it using same libraries, binaries, whatever, that you would ex get the exact same results, but this is just not the case. And this is what we call science for reachability, where each and every single project in the lab depends on complex software environments. That includes the operating system, that is for us, Mac, any Linux distro, or if you want to use it, Windows. Um, this also includes different drivers, this includes software dependencies like Python or MATLAB and what have you. And what we try to avoid is basically the computer I used was shut down a year ago. I can't rerun the analysis from a publication. And here I like, 
in person, I would look at each and every one of you because most likely none of you are, the majority of you has not used containers before or maybe any time for virtualization. Also, um, a fan favorite here, the analysis were run by my student. I have no idea where and how. And then I would look at all the PIs, which I think at the moment should just be JB and he uses containers that can really look on anyone here. Um, it's also important for collaborating with your colleagues and everyone else because sharing your code or using a repository would not, not be enough, as I already said, um, due to the aforementioned reasons. And what we try to avoid is that, oh, I forgot to mention you have to use ceiling and GCC never work for me, or I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work on Windows, which in most cases means I actually have no idea about Windows, but I will say, I'm honest, I have no idea about Windows. So therefore, that's not it. And these um, resources also give us the freedom to experiment where installing a software can be a very demanding process as you might have experienced during the setup of these uh, Rainex school um, resources where you would, for example, run some pip install, some Docker package, app get install and what have you. And most of the times, failures usually don't hurt anything and usually your old program should work. And that's a big should. Sometimes, that is quite a lot of times, um, installing something, updating a certain software or whatever, and it has a dependency from another software, and this also gets changed, will lead to some problems. And what we try to avoid with that is, I just want to undo the last five hours of my lab or work life. So the question is, are we all doomed to live in an unreproducible world forced to painfully adapt and check every script we find? Well, so far, maybe. But you could also use um, virtualization technologies to tackle this problem. And what virtualization technologies aim to do is, at first, provide a mechanism to isolate the computing environment and to encapsulate environments in a self-contained unit that can run anywhere. Therefore, we have to, or should be able to reconstruct computing entire uh, environments and share them later on to guarantee that whatever we want people to do with our code or data, that this actually is reproducible and will run. And talking about these virtualization technologies a bit more in depth with three main types here. The first one is called pure Python virtualization. This is, includes, for example, VN and Conda. Then there are containers, Docker and Singularity as possible options, and virtual machines. This is most likely the, um, the thing most people have experienced with because maybe at some point you did run a virtual machine on your computer using either VirtualBox or VMware. And if you have a look at your computer in a very, like your machine, your computing environment, whatever you have, in a very um, like stripped down version, very conceptual, you have um, the isolation in depth here. And what we're gonna cover in the session is everything towards containers. So the, Further down you go, the more virtualization you do. And that the more from a specific computing environment you will include and cover. With Python, virtual NF and Conda, you would have pure Python virtualization that mainly covers Python modules, libraries, certain binaries. But if you go any step like a bit further, we have containers and virtual machines that are able to include way more of a computing environment and follow the virtualization idea uh, to a bigger extent. And what you must remember so far is that every script and function depends on complex computing environments and thus also the results you will get from them. Isolating, reproducing, and sharing these environments is the goal of virtualization. 
and we have multiple levels of virtualization pure python virtualization containers and virtual machines where today we will only talk about pure python virtualization and containers so going back to our fancy dti analysis can we use these virtualization techniques to make it happen that is can it be run and producing the expected outputs and same results no matter who of us is running it and for that we have to find out and made the virtualization force be with us so this is the first chapter of our virtualization wars where we gonna use virtualization using virtual environments and conda and our story here is that the research galaxy went on a dark path of non-existent repeatability. However, there's a small alliance of brave Python-based resources that aim to bring back balance and ask you to join their movement. And this is what we're going to do now, virtual environments in Python. And what we can do with that as a main idea is keep the dependencies required by different projects that might be different toolboxes, scripts, analysis you're working on, or publications in distinct separate places on your machine that then allows you to work with specific versions of libraries or python itself without affecting other python projects so this mentioned problem regarding installation processes where you update back and forth different models as dependencies this is not a problem here using virtual environments in python right you keep everything in place as mentioned before we have VN, which is a remote control Python 3.4 and upwards, which is usually pre-installed. And within the terminal, you can type Python. I'm going to do that right now here. Python dash M VN. And it should be something like this. If you see that output, it means you have virtual environments available. The next one would be Conda, which is an environment manager and a package manager at the same time. And to find out if you have it installed and available just in your terminal type Conda, which would give you a bunch of outputs, or even better, which Conda which should tell you the exact version of Condor you're using, which should be the mini Condor related installation. So before we start our fascinating adventure, we're going to create a directory within which we will store the to be generated resources and materials. So therefore somewhere beyond your machine that is within like wherever you like, I'm using the desktop again, we're gonna create a directory called Galaxy. And as we learned yesterday from Ross lecture, we can create directories using MK here and then providing a path and name for our directory. And as starting from now, things might get a bit hairy in that some people might get lost on the way and don't have the comments or whatever. What you can do, I provided the comments we are going to run during this lecture in a separate file that you also downloaded and that also in the, uh, which are also in the introduction to containerization. These are called virtualization comments.sh. And if we, if you open that, in code or any other text editor, maybe not Word though, but anything else basically, you will see what it did here is based on a certain part of the lecture included all comments we are going to run. So if you get lost on the way, just have a look there and running these things there should get you where we are. Okay, next. In this server, we create a file called Ted. So we make a directory again, just 
within the directory we created. It's Galaxy and then it's called one. I said before, you can do this wherever you like. Don't like without thinking type what I type because then you will create weird paths on your machine. In terms of paths, right? Just don't copy my paths. And this is also the thing we must remember. Copy paste if you must, but please adapt paths and usernames because we will use both throughout this lecture to your machine, to your specific account and um, set it up. You can copy paste all the comments from this file here, but just copy pasting without thinking leads to the dark side that is you will just create weird paths you will not be able to nicely work with on later. And also, because we were introduced to the shell yesterday doesn't mean we're already very good at it. So therefore we have to keep practicing the shell to become a master of that. So now finally starting using um, virtual environments in Conda. And the mysterious virtual env might hold a key to enable our fancy DI analysis. We'll put this old tale to the test, working in a dedicated directory called Moisture Firm. And if you're not a Star Wars fan, I'm sorry, there's just not much I can do about this right now. So we create, oops, another directory within the Galaxy directory and then within Tatooine, and we call that Moisture Forum. Okay, and then we CD ourselves into this directory, which at the moment should be empty. And within this directory, we are going to create a new Python environment using virtual and functionality. As mentioned before, none of the resources and tools, programs we are using today does have a graphical user interface. Everything is command line based, command line being the shell and terminal here. The respective syntax we're going to use or we need to use is depicted here. Can I? Nope, I cannot. Um, it's called or it's written Python dash M V N and then name, where name is the name of your new Python environment we're going to create. Here you can use almost every character name, but providing a meaningful name for environments is never a bad idea. That being said, we will call our environment. Uh, C3PO. So we just type Python dash M virtual environment and C3PO. Oh, and there's a typo. And then we get not much as an output, that is nothing, which is fine, this is expected. And if we type ls now, we see that a folder just named as our Python environment was created called C3PO. And if we now check what's within that folder, we see a bunch of things. We have three directories called bin, include, and lib. And what they entail is that bin this entails the files that interact directly with your virtual environment binaries. You have an include C headers that compile the Python packages you're going to install and use within that environment and lib for libraries, which is a copy of the Python version along with site packages where each dependency is installed. Now is the question, how can we use this newly created Python environment? Well, first we activate it by using the activate.sh script 
that lies within the bin directory. And for that, we're just going to type source, see, free PO, dash bin, slash activate. And if we hit enter now, we again should get nothing as an output in our command line here. However, we are in our newly created Python environment and can use its resources where the change of the environment should be indicated, the display of its name left to the common prompt. And this is only visible in the shell here. So as you can see here, I have here prefix C3PO before my common prompt and username, whatever, indicating that I'm within my newly created Python environment. And as this is usually the first breakpoint in terms of a lot of people are getting problems, I'm going to wait. I saw a lot of questions popping up, and we can now address them. Addressing meaning JB and the other TAs, pointing them towards me in case they can't solve it or they want to discuss it openly. Uh, so the crucial point. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, uh, Perl. Yeah, uh, the crucial point here is that everyone should be able to source that is activate the newly created Python environment. So there's a couple of uh, there's one permission error. So bash uh, C3PO slash bin activate permission denied. Oh no, Melissa figured it out, so this is fine. Okay, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that's fine. <laughs> Should we forget the source, the sources. So the source, the command, the, the, the bash command source is actually uh, to launch, to actually uh, to execute uh, a script, a uh, bash script. So this is uh, what you're doing by doing source, uh, this uh, activate thing, you're just uh, executing this uh, activate script. So that will uh, set up your uh, uh, virtual environment. So be patient with those things. Uh, those, those, uh, you know, most of the, a lot of the time of, uh, uh, that we spent is uh, in trying to install properly things. Uh, so, uh, you know, like you're, you're, you're experimenting the problem of installation that, uh, uh, you know, you're uh, creating your environment that will make all those installations much easier. So that uh, will take a bit of time for some of you, especially on Windows to, uh, to figure, and for us to help you uh, figure it out. So we'll uh, take a few minutes to uh, see um, how things uh, are going. Uh, so uh, only maybe only chat if uh, things are going uh, uh, not too well, uh, so that we can concentrate on the uh, on the problems. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, it's Sylvan, Sylvania, you have like a get uh, CD bin activate, no such file or directory. Uh, I don't think that directory exists. Uh, you have to check whether that directory exists. And uh, thank yes, I think uh, Elizabeth is, is answering you uh, your question. I get bash. No such file or directory. Uh, so, are you sure that you created the virtual environment, uh, Sibania, before? Like, uh, you did, uh, you did the uh, Python uh, command first. So, the Python command first is uh, creating that. Uh, uh, yes, this Python method minus m dash m view um, virtual env c three po is actually doing the virtual environment and creating those things and then you have to activate it. So Olivia is saying that I can't get to the directory to create Galaxy. Uh, 
So Olivia, you should be able to create Galaxy um, in your uh, current environment. I don't think there is a, a specific uh, like a, a specific place. Uh, I think uh, uh, Pear, you created your your first Galaxy uh, directory uh, from your desktop. So that's uh, that's one way of doing it. But you, if you have a working directory somewhere, I think uh, it, it shouldn't matter where you create that directory. It just uh, yeah, exactly. It should not matter though. The important part is you just remember where it is and go into that directory at some right. point. So, so like, uh, so for some people, the make the make dir slash path to the gal slash to slash galaxy is a bit uh, confusing because uh, uh, you don't have to. You should not take that literally. Uh, the slash path slash two is actually you know where uh, the galaxy uh, directory should be uh, uh, created. So it's not uh, you have to replace the slash path slash two uh, to by, for instance. Uh, uh, your uh, path to the desktop or something like that. Yeah, that's so the remember uh, remember the uh, uh, Russ uh, lecture. This I mean, so this this like slash path slash two uh, commands uh, part of the the path uh, should be replaced by your own uh, location. Yeah, sorry for not making that more clear. Though I for Yoda is doing the job here, but this is what is referred to by uh, the copy paste if you must, but adapting the path and username to your machine necessary is common. That is whenever you see the uh, path to whatever, this is the part you have to add to your machine, right? This has to be like some path on your machine and then everything afterwards, this, this is what you keep. This is what you're going to work with. This is basically just a placeholder file card that you need to replace. So it could be your desktop and put like create galaxy on desktop. It could be your home directory. If you have a special folder or directory for this whole brain hack school, you can create it there. Just somewhere create galaxy. No, oh, I can actually put it up. So that's helpful. Okay, so or, we're getting yeah. there, I think, if uh, we only have a couple of people. Uh, so uh, I think, Pierre, you should, for the sake of uh, time, we should yeah. go on. And uh, we'll, uh, I mean, uh, we'll make sure that, Olivia, you, you will catch up. Uh, yeah. It's also good that I, I'm somewhat able to see the chat here. It's good to know. Okay. So assuming... Uh, you, you do have, sorry, you do have a question for the last line. So C3PO oh. has been to activate since, since the moisture farm directory. Uh, you have to go back. Do we have to go back in that directory to activate it? So right now you should be um, in the moisture farm directory. Like within Galaxy Tatooine moisture farm, you should be in there. And from within Moisture Farm, without going anywhere else, you type source C3PO bin activate and run it. Because as we saw, C3PO is a directory within Moisture Farm. And within C3PO, we have bin include and lib. And within binary, we have our activate file. Okay, assuming that most of you are there, um, we're going to continue. So if we want now to work with another directory or just want to leave that virtual directory uh, environment, only thing we have to type is deactivate. So bash once more. This or Python is very helpful here because we type what we want to do. And then you can see CPO, C3PO is disappearing again here from my left side of my comment prompt, meaning we are back. Right now, for me, it's my base directory. Okay. And now that we have that and have our virtual environment, we try running our fancy DTI analysis again. 
after waiting our wireman. And for the ease of use, we're going to um, practice bash a bit more in that also to uh, we're going to move our fancy DTI analysis script from the downloaded folder to our Galaxy folder. So once more, if you see path to whatever here, please exchange this path to to wherever you downloaded um, the course materials to using the git clone command. So for me, it was, so mv move, if you remember correctly from yesterday. For me, it was on my desktop, I have the course materials. Within it, I have lectures, 12th of May, and the second lecture, which is into the containerization. Within that, I have fancy DTI analysis.py. And if you think about yesterday's lecture, move works is that we use move as a comment. And then the first one is what do we want to move and where do we want to move is the second comment. And I want to move it to my Galaxy folder. And if I did everything correct, I should have this file in my Galaxy folder, which I can investigate doing ls and then pointing to my Galaxy directory. And within that, I see Tatooine, the directory we created before, and now fancy the analysis.py. Okay, we're going to activate our virtual environment again. Always checking, we're seeing its name on the set of our comment prompt, which is the case here. Nice. And then we try to run our script again. Indicating Python. And that we do dot dot slash dot dot fancy analysis fancy DTI analysis dot pi and the dot dot here indicates that we want to go one directory above where we are. That is the first dot dot brings us um, from Moisture Farm to Tatooine and the second one brings us to Galaxy. So this is like a bash way of using, this is a relative path, right? This is not absolute. I could also type the absolute path that is for me, users per health, desktop galaxy, fancy the analysis.py. But as I said before, as you want to work a bit more with the shell and uh, and bash in particular. It's a nice way to also like trends. And we're using this as a relative path, relative path here. So if we try to run it, we again get the DiPy error. And now all of us, and I mean all of us, should get the exact same error. As right now, we are working in a, at least in Python virtualization terms, exact the same environment. So everyone should have the no module name DiPy error. But why is that? Why I'm also now getting this error, even though it did run before? The reason is fairly simple. It is that when you create virtual environments, already installed packages are not automatically included in your new Python environment or virtual environment. You have to install them again. Every Python environment you have in your machine is its own identity in the sense that between environments, binaries, libraries, and what have you are not shared. They are not visible and or, I mean, they're accessible, but not by default, right? and which Python environment you're currently using to execute a certain functionality is set by the uh, dollar sign path variable in your shell profile or manual build, manually by you by activating it. So right now, um, we are in C3PO, our new Python virtual environment, and this just doesn't have DiPy because we did not install it and it, can, it cannot access 
the other DiPy I was using before because it is a complete independent Python environment. Can I can I say what I think uh, uh, I understand from the virtual environment? Uh, uh, just and correct me, uh, Per. Yeah. Uh, the way I see the, those virtual environments is that they install all the uh, the Python uh, itself and all the packages that you will need somewhere. And uh, what you do is then you set the path when you activate that virtual environment. You set the path where your your commands are going to look for. Uh, the, play, the, the, the binaries, the places where your comments are going to look for uh, for launching things, uh, you set those paths to be directed to that to these uh, installed uh, 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 things. So, so basically, you just recreate a little place where you put all your patterns or DiPy or your uh, Python packages that you want, and then when you activate that environment, you're saying, okay. Now, if I type uh, something like a Python, then instead of looking for my Python on my system somewhere, I will be looking uh, in that specific Python that I just installed. And then, you know, if I type NumPy, there will be that specific in NumPy that I've just installed. In, uh, so you basically create that uh, virtual environment so using uh, changing the path where you're looking for things uh, and uh, encapsulating this, uh, this uh, uh, and, and basically, so, so the only thing is that if you have uh, looking for a package that is not in your virtual environment, then maybe that package will be looked for elsewhere. Uh, I think that's, uh, I don't know exactly uh, what's happened there, but uh, so that's conceptually, I think what uh, is happening here, but uh, Pear, please uh, correct me or um, uh, yeah, uh, let the students know what you think, uh, uh, how you see things. Yeah, yeah. no, this is exactly um, what are we going to do next? <laughs> Oh, sorry. Because, <laughs> no, it's was good. You, uh, you explained, explained it perfectly fine, though. Now, um, to also see what's going on, we can just do what you just told us um, in, in the shell and watch it. So, as JB said, you can check which Python environment is currently set um, by, for example, now we can use which Python. So, if we type which Python, we see the Python binary and compiles everything that is used to execute and run Python and all its modules and whatnot is the um, Python of the environment C3PO because this is where it points to, right? So for you, it should be the same, right? It should be binary C3PO monster from Tatooine Galaxy and then whatever path you have here. And now what we can do is to uh, deactivate it again and run which, oops, sorry, which Python again, and you should see a different Python. Now you should see the default Python that is running on your machine. For me, it's my Anaconda Miniconda distribution Python that I'm running as a default. For you, as um, good Rainix school participants, you should have the uh, mini conda bin python that you installed for this course. Okay, and you can see it, these are different, completely different pythons that are going to be run and executed with all their underlying libraries, binaries. And if we now investigate path, also a thing to be mentioned, and little uh, disclaimer here, path should look different for everyone here. So the path is just something you said or that programs are like adding themselves to after asking you. So for me, this is how my path variable looks because you can see I have like some neural imaging software as well that I need to be able to access quickly and run. But the important thing is that one here, the first thing is my anaconda or miniconda free binaries where my default Python is living. So whenever I'm running some Python code now, this is going to be used. Now, if we source see free PO again and type echo path again, you can see that this has changed now, right? The first Python we are looking in 
is our C free PO Python. And it this like supersedes our Anaconda Python. Right? The second place for you should be your default Python that you got via Miniconda. And the first one now should be C3PO Python. So therefore, whenever we're running something Python now, this is the Python we're going to use. And this is exactly the thing GB was pointing towards. Okay, this I already said, yes. Um, and important here to remember is that while this is at the core of virtualization, that is you can run different environments with their own specific setups, you have to pay close attention what and how you're executing function and scripts using which environment, right? Because chances are, and I'm no exception to that, I spend a whole afternoon wondering why everything broke down. And then I just remembered I never deactivated my project specific Python environment. And this was exactly the point I wanted to do, undo the last five hours of my life because I was trying to solve installation problems and errors. And I just was not paying close attention and forgot to deactivate my virtual environment. So always have a look at what's activated at a given point in time and which Python you're running. And this extends to non Python um, stuff. This could be like different versions of any other software. So now that we are in our C3PO environment, let's populate it because right now it's kind of empty, right? And first of all, foremost, we need DiPy because we want, want to run DiPy functionality. So we type pip install DiPy. And you haven't heard pip install before, it's a package manager that allows you to easily install Python packages libraries. So in the syntax just says pip install and then what the name of whatever Python module you would like to install. And if we hit enter now, there's a lot of things going on. That's all good. Also tells me I should upgrade pip. We just ignored it for now. And as you can see, and it's written here, way more than the IPy was installed. We also get NumPy, SciPy 6, H5, Pi, PyProsing, Packaging, and iBabel. And this is because also the dependencies, which is based on most Python libraries containing a rope clients.txt file, these dependencies are listed, um, will automatically be installed because DiPy depends on functionality from all these other Python modules does. You need run DiPy as it should be or run. You need also all these other packages so that DiPy can use it or use or use them. So therefore, most likely when you install any Python libraries of your chance, you will get one or the other Python library module as well. And you can also check our just created environment in terms of which libraries, modules, whatever is installed by using pip again, because pip also has a handy functionality called pip freeze. And if we type pip freeze, we get a list of all the Python modules available and installed in that Python environment and their specific versions. As you can see, DiPy equals I equals sign 1.1.1. And we can also save the output of pip freeze to create our own requirements.txt. So assuming that DTI analysis would run now, we know that it runs using these Python modules and versions, so we could create a requirements.txt to be shared with our um, function. And to do that, it's the yes, typing pip freeze again, and then parsing the output to a file called requirements.txt. 
txt. If we do that, we get no output because we parse the output to regrinds.txt, but we can use um, cat again to, I'm um, sorry, I'm not good at typing simultaneously, um, to expect what's in there and we can see it's the list of our Python modules and their versions. And folks, this already is a form of virtualization of Python environments, right? You, as said before, you can use this requirement.txt and share it with your script function or what have you and say, these are the requirements, these are the dependencies, the specific versions that you need to run or need to have to run the analysis as I did. But before we're actually going to share it, we try to run our analysis again. So we type again, Python dot dot slash dot dot slash density dialysis dot pi. Again, depending on your machine setup, what's currently going on in your machine, this might take a while. But it's all good. As you can see, it's also taking a while for me. And there we go. Oh, okay. Everyone should get an error again. Because again, we are all working in the same environment. And what we have now is an import error called cannot import name window. So it might not seem like that, but it's actually good because we can now work on resolving all these specific errors to make it run in our environment. And thus create an environment that is rather specifically targeted to our goal of running these DI analysis, then sharing our most likely large default Python environment, which includes a lot of libraries that we do not need to run the analysis. Most Python packages um, comparable to Git and what Elizabeth mentioned yesterday have very useful error messages like the one we are receiving. And paying a bit more attention, we see that something's missing and after short DuckDuckGo or any other searchlight engine you might want to use for this session, um, we know that the Fury package is missing. And this is an easy fix because we can just use our package manager pip to install it. pip install Fury. and hit enter. Again, we can see that not only Fury was installed, but also for example, VTK and Pillow in this case, as both are dependencies for Fury. Okay, now we should have that. And we try to run our analysis again. Take a while again. That's all good. Gives us time to breathe and think. Okay, there we go. Yet another error again. The fun never stops with these things. Important, important here, remember this feeling of being stressed and annoyed because this will be important on later in the lecture, okay? Remember how hard it was to get this thing running. So we need to install matplotlib, but then again, by now that's no problem for us at all. We just run pip install matplotlib. And we get some other packages as well. No problem. And at this point, I know already it works for me, or it should work for me. Let's see. Okay, and we are seeing nothing, no output. But then again, we can use ls to check what's there, and we see, yes, we got three PNG files and one TRK file. Amazing. 
it works on my machine. So I assume um, you can also run interactive, but I'm going to skip that for now. What we can do now is at least I can do that because it runs for me. I can use pip freeze again to recreate my requirements.txt. And if I check that file, I have now all the modules and the versions need to run the analysis, at least on my machine. And there's a large emphasis on my machine. Most likely because there will be multiple problems and limitations. For some of you, it still won't work. The interactive mode is the thing we won't tackle due to time now, but this will create way more problems. And sharing my requirements.txt won't share my entire Python, and especially not Python itself, right? Because with the requirements, we're only sharing modules, but not the Python version we're running um, itself. And this is a big problem. Can I get a quick, um, like, where, where we are at? Who was able to run it? Who got the outputs? Just post it in the chat or Slack or that we can see. I'm able to run it flat. That's great. Got it. Yes. Good. Nice. Still downloading. Yes. Sorry. Yep. Good. Great. Downloading. Oof, that's a slow internet connection, buddy. Yep. Downloading. Great. Still downloading. Okay. Okay. Got depression error and proceeding. So it's okay. Still downloading. Oh, still keep downloading that way. Ooh. Okay. Oh, there. There we got a nope. Yes. Okay. That was what I was hoping for. Um, <laughs> some people definitely should not get an output because it would something is still missing, something more in depth. Um, because which environments usually won't be enough, even though you did already way more than the majority of scientists when it comes to reproducibility and sharing their code. Um, just let me show that, sorry. And for that reason, we have to go one step further with Conda. And to do this again in an easy, reducible way, we are going to create a new directory that is not our kernel degree moisture from with its C3PO environment, but a different one. So, and we're going to call that most Isley. And we're going to create that in Galaxy Tattooing so that Moisture Firm and most Isley are on the same level, essentially. And then we're gonna see ourselves into this new created directory. Where you should be then. And this should be empty, of course. Given that we are going to try out a new way of virtualization within uh, pure Python, there's one thing I have to do, be, be sure to not mess things up tremendously, and that is deactivate my C3PO environment again. So that we are back to our base default system, whatever you have Python. Yeah, uh, just seeing it in the chat though, if you see warning, uh, duplication warnings, that is, should be okay. You should still get the output. If it's a warning, yeah, Elizabeth already mentioned, like answered it perfectly. Thank you. I also saw someone asking if your computer should start making loud noises while running the script. Um, yes, depending on your setup and machine, it should make loud noises. That's all fine. I mean, not entirely fine, but this is expected and it will not ruin your machine 
in the, for the future. Don't worry. Okay. While we used vENV to create our virtual environment and PIP as a package manager before, we can now use Conda for both as it co combines the respective functionality needs. That is, Conda can be used to create virtual environments and also to install Python packages. And recreating our virtual environment from before, that is the entire, the final virtual environment, not the basic one, we started with the entire one where everything worked, is very easy and straightforward for Conda, with the general syntax being Conda create dash n name, Python version and libraries where name is the name of our virtual environment, or the one we would like it to be called, Python version, the exact Python version you want to use, this is something we could not do with, we could do with virtual environments, but we did not. And also already include libraries, that is all the packages we want to install, right? So adapted to our mission, that is recreating the environment, this is how everything should look like. And this is everything we need. We're gonna type conda create dash n, also include a dash y, I will explain that in a minute. Then we name our environment R2D2. Once again, if you're not into Star Wars or already tired of these Star Wars things, I'm sorry, there's not much I can do about this at this point in time. And then we write Python 3.7 because we want to use Python 3.7, the specific version. We now need DiPy and we know we need plotlib to be installed. And Fury, I'm sorry, I'm not done. Did not include that there here. Yeah. And then we run it. And as mentioned before, this will automatically create the environment we had before with all the uh, packages. So we don't have to create environment, then within that use pip to gather all the uh, requested or required packages. We can do everything in one go using Conda, which already saves us a big amount of time and hassle, which is nice. Also the output here is a bit more in depth. Don't be, don't feel stressed or inside, it's all good. Again, depending on your machine and also now internet connection, it might take a while. I'm sitting at the far end of my apartment, further away from the router, it's basically not possible, therefore it also takes a while here from me. But we'll all get there. Okay. And then we got a nice output and saying all the information saying we have already these packages, these will be installed or were installed. And to activate our environment, um, we're going to need running conda activate and conda deactivate for the installation, uh, deactivation, sorry. So as we can see, conda by default already installs a fair amount of libraries as compared to VM. It's a bit more than in VM, right? Because it, let's say it looks a bit further and knows a bit more what's going on and that all, like other packages are needed as well. And we can check our environment for typing ls, we see nothing. There's no folder there. If you remember our previous adventure using virtual env, we saw our folder that was called just as our Python environment was called. And the reason we don't see anything here is that it's um, last two points more important difference between VNF and Conda, and we'll check that further now. And we can find out where our newly created our Conda in, uh, environment is living. 
So we type condor activate as we already learned through the helpful output message, condor activate R2D2. And then we see again that we have its name left from our common prompt R2D2. And then as from before, you remember we use source and pointing to the one that activates H script, but we have to now, as we use Conda, have to use Conda specific comments as Conda is its own program with its own environments that are not being created as a specific directory as we did through virtual env, but within the Conda installation at hand. And we can check that again using which Python, oh, not which Python, that is wrong, which Python. And then we see within our default Python, for me it's Anaconda 3, for you should be Miniconda something, we have a new directory called ENVs for environments. And within that we have now R2D2, bin and Python. So within our default Python, the new Conda environment was created. Bear, can I have a quick question for you? I think it yes. came up. Uh, I think it came up, and I'm not sure you answered it already. Uh, how uh, can people have uh, both of the best uh, of the world? Like, uh, could you have like a, a virtual Python environment uh, into uh, in a Conda environment, or is it uh, what? What is the how those two things play together if they do at all? Um. This is not an easy question, uh, easy question to, but there's no easy answer to that, basically. Um, I would not advise to use um, like virtual environments within Conda environments or the other way around, because it goes very quickly, goes out of hand in that what is sourced when, where is stuff downloaded, which channels are you using to download something, it goes back and forth. And it's kind of easy to get lost. And it's not easy to disentangle where you are. Um, therefore, I personally always use Conda for my environments and everything I do within that uh, manner. I know other people never use Conda, but just use virtual env. Um, and I guess that depends if you are only using Python packages for which uh, virtual env is uh, since. Uh, uh, to be the right tool, and then uh, if you are using other packages than Python packages, maybe uh, Conda would be the right thing. Yes, exactly. Depending yeah. on your project and what you're working with. Also, I think it's, Conda... a, it's a very good advice not to uh, try to mix the both. I think, uh, I mean, uh, maybe there are some TAs with uh, experience with that, so please uh, chime in if you want. I uh, just uh, wanted to clarify uh, those the how you you know those two tools. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Also, con environments tend to be a bit bigger as they are installing a bit more um, packages and can be a bit more heavy. So if storage space is of the essence and you, for you, it doesn't make a difference if you use VN for con, or just use VN. But yeah, I think I, for me personally, con is just a bit, it's easier to use. Like it comes with more integrated functionality, for example, the one we're going to check now regarding to our environment, which is conda info dash dash ends, which should you which should provide you with a list of um, the conda environments installed or created on your machine and where they are. So I have a bunch. I have a base environment, I have a neural data 2020 environment, like for this course, and I have my R2D2 environment. And for all of them, I see where they are living. And the star here, asterisk, marks which one I'm currently using, which is R2D2. We can also check, comparable to pip freeze, um, the installed packages. But we now, if we type that, first of all, way more packages, as said. But we also get not only the name and the version, but also the specific build and conduct channel that was used to gather and install that package. So we have way more information than um, using pip freeze.
as within virtual env, we can also export this environment and share it. The syntax is, however, different. That is, we can use um, conda env export to r2d2 dash yml instead of using pip freeze and parse that to requirements.txt. And it takes a bit longer, it's just more information to be processed. And what we do there, or with that now, is um, the currently active, active environment that is R2D2 and all its modules is going to be exported and acquired information saved to a YAML file, which is R2D2.yml. YAML files are another form of text file. And if we check that again, we got um, the name of our environment, the channels used to gather all the uh, modules, and the dependencies to create that environment, including their version and specific build. Which already brings you way further than virtual end at this point. Okay. Now that we already have that, we can just try to run our analysis again. So whoops. As I said before, depending on machine and internet connection, downloads and running these things might take a while. Your computer might start making loud noises. It's only temporary, don't worry. Also taking a while for me, even though I have a new MacBook and the highest specification. So that just doesn't buy you much apparently. Oh, there we go. Oh, interesting. So this is very exciting actually. Now we get no module named PII. I think for lots of you, this should be the same, right? Depending on how you set it up and how you run it, and depending on a specific version, I actually anticipated a different error, which is Fury should not have been installed. Because usually when I tried it yesterday, I did run all the comments yesterday and then Fury was not installed as Conda was written install Fury because it was not included there, but only through pip. So we got another thing. That's nice. And it's also apparently my curse here because last year when I gave this lecture, also the code base was changed on the day I was running it and downloading stuff. So that's fun. But anyway, we can do this. We now have to find out how to install the module named PIL. Therefore, first thing what we can just try is using pip install PLI. Could not find the version. Well, that's not surprising. Conda install PLI. Now what Conda does is looking for different channels and doesn't find it. So as you can see, as I'm seeing the chat for some, it worked, which is funny, but this is exactly what we're trying to show with this um, lecture, right? It doesn't work for anyone, like for all of us. Um, different errors popping up at different stages. So what I'm gonna do, is what I always do since a couple of years now, Googling errors. And as usual, stack overflow is very helpful. Oh, and some of you, I must install import image, which is apparently is solve. Okay, pip install image, as we can see here. Pip install pillow. Okay, let's do that. Pip install, whoops, image, downloading. Now what I'm doing now is just trying to solve my error as we go. And then see. 
So what I did try, if it doesn't work for you, also just try pip install image so that we can get at this exciting journey together. Spoiler, it's not exciting, it's really annoying. <laughs> and then we run our analysis again. Then let's see if that was the case. Actually, but yeah, always fun. So the next few slides don't really um, matter anymore because Pippin Software wasn't a thing. But yeah, okay, I don't get an error, right? I get the um, replicated warnings that some of you got before, which is good. It's nice. So let's see if it's there. And yes, it works again. Nice. So that was an easy solve, luckily. Um, let's see if that thing we did before, pip install image and then run it again, if that did solve it for everyone else. Can I just get in the chat if it works for you or not? Works for me, great. Works, works, cool. Yes, good, nice. Great stuff. Okay, for some it worked most likely. Oh yeah, same Ember as before. For some, yes, there we go. It's not working for all of us. And this, the reason therefore is, is that the pure Python virtualization for us is quite often not enough. A certain libraries and binaries does dependencies on the operating system level are needed. And therefore our whole endeavor requires a bit more. So before we go further, what you must remember from this section so far is that specific Python libraries and their versions can be shared using vnf and pip. But to share a specific Python version itself, the builds and channels, you need to use Conda, which also does a bit more in the background for you. Conda is an environment manager comparable to VF and also a package manager comparable to PIP, combining both functionalities. And the pure Python virtualization is usually not enough because there are libraries and binaries on other levels of virtualization and your machine that Python virtualization will not account for and won't be able to handle. And with that, we are gonna relax for 10 minutes. We are way over time. I'm sorry, but as I said before, I prefer that you have a, the best possible understanding that we are just rushing through these things. Um, so let's relax maybe for five minutes if that's okay for you instead of 10 to make up a bit. Um, and then we see us again, let's say 2.50 PM. Okay. And I'm gonna stay. Yeah, I'm going to stay here in case you have questions. Yes, yeah, six minutes, uh, please. Uh, sorry that this is so dense, uh, Bear. We have to be a little bit on time for the uh, assessment, so I can't, we can't delay yeah. too much. So no, sure, sure. we can have like a five, 10 minutes uh, more, but uh, I think we'll have to make sure that, you know, at the uh, analyzation technology. Thank you a lot. Okay, um, let me see if I can get the chat again, so that I can see something here. Okay, um, everyone can see my screen? Yeah, okay, if I don't get any, yeah, that seems about right. Okay, so as you remember, we have three different types, main types of virtualization. This is pure Python virtualization, which covers everything like within here, right? Python virtual and con and this is what we just did. The problem is that true virtualization is more like in the in in most like truer sense is achieved through things like Docker and containers and not Conda. Therefore, we have to go to a new chapter in our virtualization world. This is Docker and containers as a new hope because after a long time of training using virtual and Conda, you now became virtualization padawans, which enables you to use a stronger virtualization force than pure Python virtualization. And this is a new, much needed hope on the horizon. 
And this is uh, containers, Docker or Singularity as different versions. And this is rooted and located within this level of um, virtualization. As we already saw in the old Republic of Virtual Anything Conda, the for pure force of uh, Python virtualization is not enough. We need more virtually and literally, and thus need to explore new frontiers like these container technologies. Before we can do that, we need to go to the container, to the Docker Academy of the container order to learn how to use this tremendous force. Where in the beginning, we need to talk about the difference between virtual machines, which some of you might have already used, and containers. And this is basically how it looks. These are in a very nice, um, easy, graphical way explain the difference between virtual machines and containers. Where you can already see that the main difference here is that we're starting out with an infrastructure, which can be your laptop, like a server machine, or the cloud. You have your operating system, your post operating system, and then this is where both technologies like diverge. On virtual machines, you have a hypervisor layer that enables you to build entire OS, guest OS called here, on your machine. So saying you're running a Linux distribution here and for whatever reason want to have a Windows OS and a Mac OS and another Linux OS, this is how you would do it in a virtual machine. All of it entirely emulated and independent and not accessible by one another, right? Different entities. Now, if we use containers, instead of the hypervisor, we have the Docker engine. That is actually not entirely true. Um, just to be completely clear, on Windows and Mac, based on the underlying things that are built in this machine and how the operating system is set up, you also have a minimal hypervisor layer here. But the difference is that you're not emulating complete entire systems as you do here, guest operating systems, but you can directly access your computers or machines, whatever you have, resources, and only need to include binaries and libraries in certain applications. Um, where in virtual machines, the hypervisor shares and manages hardware of the host and executes guest operating system and have their own dedicated resources. While when we go to containers, they do share the host system kernels with other containers. They still get their own isolated user space, but only libraries and binaries are created from scratch. scratch. And therefore, containers are very lightweight and fast to start up because you don't need all these other thing, things around here to get your system running, but only libraries and binaries. And then on top of that, certain applications. A container is a closed environment and will use the exact same software version drivers independent from the system it runs on, with Docker being the leading software container platform. While the last few years also like it shifted a bit. Um, Docker in itself is an open source project. It runs on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Yes, it should run on Windows. For most of you, it's running on Windows. And in the last years, Windows did some good work on enabling Docker and other container technologies in their machines. Some years back, this was way harder than it is now. And a problem is with Docker, um, it can escalate privileges. So you can be officially treated as a root on the host system because as I said before, the containers, all these libraries and binaries and all the system, operating systems you're going to create through containers, can directly or should be able to directly access your host machines, your laptop, what have you, resources, CPU, RAM, and all of these things. And this is usually not supported by administrators from HCPs and those high performance uh, computing centers, which is fair because if you allow certain people to have root privileges on a large HCP, you can basically count the seconds till everything goes straight to South Schittsburg. So that's not what you want to do. Therefore, you want to run Singularity, which is another container solution, but specifically created 
for scientific application of workloads and that supports existing and traditional HCP resources because a user inside a singularity container is the same user as outside a singularity container. Therefore, you don't need those root privileges to run singularity containers once they are set up. Therefore, the users don't need all these privileges. And it also can run existing Docker containers. So on tomorrow, you will learn a bit more about HCPs and specifically um, Compute Canada from Felix. And it would tell you a bit more about that. So Compute Canada is no exception to this rule, right? Docker images, Docker containers won't run on HCP like Compute Canada, right? Therefore, you would need to have singularity. And what you must remember from the super short like conceptual introduction to containers is that the host's kernel is shared between the containers and thus they are way more lightweight and faster than virtual machines are. And if you want to run containers and use these technologies on HTTP, you need to run Singularity instead of Docker. But we're going to talk a bit more about it um, later on. So it's a big question, where is Docker? Where is it? Again, Docker as virtual and Anaconda is a command line based tool. It does not have a graphical user interface. On Unix-based OS, Ubuntu, and Mac OS X, just open a terminal and type Docker. And what you should see is something like this. On Windows, now this depends if you're using Docker Toolbox or the engine, or if you're able to run it in the subsystem for Linux. Open up whatever works for you and type Docker, and you should see the same output. And this is um, the so-called Docker man page providing helpful information, how to use Docker and how to work with it, which is nice. If you are on Mac or if you run the Docker desktop app for Windows, you also have this super, oops, sorry, can I get here? This nice friendly little whale somewhere. Uh, for Mac, it's in the menu bar. For Windows, I think there's something going on over here. Um, and you can also like have a Docker um, menu that looks something like this. But this is a Mac OS and Windows uh, desktop specific thing and we don't need it, just that you know that it's there. <clears throat> um, as you already saw for the main page, there's a lot we can do with Docker. But before we go into the depths of the Docker Galaxy, we make sure it works. And therefore, we're going to run the by now infamous Docker run Hello World. And what you should see, if everything is OK, is something like this. And this is the crucial point here. Hello from Docker. This message shows you or shows that your installation appears to be working correctly. Therefore, if you see that, we are good to go for Docker. And now we can a bit decipher what's happening here. So if we type Docker run hello world, as we did here, we tell Docker the tool the program docker to run or execute a container called hello world then if the wanted container is not already on your machine because as I said before these are entities that can be shared and are encapsulated docker automatically search for and downloads it i think most of you did run it before so you won't have these things here this is specifically for me now because I deleted the container again so that I can show you this thing here. What Docker is doing is that telling us I'm unable to find this image. It's not on your machine. Therefore, I'm looking for it in this thing called the internet. And if it finds it somewhere, it will download it, providing with a shower digest and then telling you download it in your image. Once it's downloaded, it runs, and this is 
what it does. Docker images are stored in a special place in the galaxy, and this is called the Docker Hub. And in most cases, Docker images are stored at a certain place within Docker Hub, depending on Docker ND and how what do you work with, depending on organization that shares it, a lab or private person. And on Docker Hub, folks can upload and store as many Docker images as they want for free. And the only requirement you need to have is a Docker ID. So for example, if you look at the um, Paul Drag Lab from Stanford Docker Hub page, they created this nice and by now very famous tool called FMIA Prep. And you can see that it has by now over 100,000 downloads, which is a big deal and a nice argument of people telling you software sharing or working on software is not rewarded. Um, once you have your own image build, which we do later, it's super easy to upload Docker images to the Docker Hub with your, your Docker ID. It's just called Docker Push, and then whatever your image name is, and then it will automatically be uploaded to Docker Hub and be available there as long as you would like it to be before you delete it. Or you can automatically build it from a GitHub repository, therefore efficiently combining version control and virtualization that is after each comment, after each PR, whatever you do in a GitHub repository, if it's connected to Docker Hub, it will automatically build the new image for you, which is amazing. Now, let's further explore Docker commands within a typical workflow. At first, we want to download a certain Docker container to work with. For the sake of simplicity, we're going to use the classic Ubuntu container. Instead of automatically downloading it via Docker run, we use the respective Docker command, which is Docker pull and then the image name. That's what we need to type right now is called Docker pull Ubuntu. And once we're there, we are running it. And if you did not install that container before, you should see a comparable output as I do. It tells us using the full tech latest where it's pulling from, that is library slash Ubuntu, and then has these cryptic number letter combinations and telling us download and now pull complete the digest and then status. And what you see here is that all these different things here, these cryptic number letter combinations are so-called layers. Layers, specific parts of and like software parts, resources, libraries, binaries, that are needed to create the classic Ubuntu container. So each and every single aspect that is needed is gathered, downloaded, pulled, and then your new Ubuntu, like or the Ubuntu image is created. And if you see that message here, status, download, newer image for Ubuntu latest, you're good. Everything worked fine. Is that working so far for everyone, except the people that did not manage to get Docker running in the first place? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, 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 okay. Yes, 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 some error. Yes, 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 okay, good. Yeah, for some of you, you might, especially on Unix-based systems, you might need sudo, that is um, run the command as a sudo or as a root or as a, as a being with root privileges, admin privileges. And as Sebastian mentioned there, you can also get rid of the pseudo issues. I can also set that Docker always runs with pseudo issues. Um, is it possible to not get the pull complete messages? Uh, I 
maybe on Windows, I don't know. Usually you should get it. If you see status download in your image for Ubuntu latest, if you see that, that's okay. Then we are good to go. Okay, sake of time, folks, I'm gonna continue. And we can check all the um, existing Docker images we have on our machine using Docker images. So if we type Docker images, we see, um, let me make that a bit smaller. Let's see if that's working here. No, not really. No, okay. And I will quickly change the thing here. So what we have is um, you get a list of all the Docker images on your machine where you get the name of the repository. For us, we have Ubuntu and Hello World as these are the only two images we used so far. Their tech, their image ID, when they were created and how big they are. And you might now wonder 73.9 MB that can be it, but yeah, that's it. That's all you need to run a very basic entire Ubuntu operating system. It's very important that we address this tag thing because by default, as you can see here, using default tag latest, Docker pull will always search and if it's there, download images with the tag latest. Hence, if you want a other version, a certain version, like an older release, the development version, maybe there's no latest version at all, you need to indicate the respective tag. And you can do that by typing docker pull Ubuntu as before. It's a colon, and then whatever version you would like to have. So for Ubuntu, a version could be 18.04. It could be 16.04 or any other of the Ubuntu versions that have an containerized version. What we must remember from this section is that Docker has no graphic user interface. Docker images are hosted on Docker Hub. By default, Docker pull will always search and download latest. Um, packed images, specific tags and versions need to be specified if you want to have them. Docker images are composed of layers that are shared between images. Therefore, once again, they are very lightweighted and slim. And Docker images contain an entire operating system, even though they're very small. Now we want to work with our newly downloaded Docker image, right? We want to use it to do something, namely our DTI analysis, for example. So we decide to run or execute it. And we do that by saying Docker run Ubuntu. And as before with the Hello World container, it's the same thing, right? We're telling Docker the program resource tool to run a certain container or image, which is Ubuntu. If we run that, Docker use run, nothing happened. And now you might say all the fuss for that, I like already sitting like two hours, 50 minutes into this freaking lecture and now Docker is doing nothing. Well, each Docker image is built for a specific reason and purpose. It's kind of very dystopic, like future where everything is built for a specific reason and purpose. This is true for containers already. So hence, what happens when you run a given Docker container depends, more or less, exclusively on its setup and definition. So it is therefore super important to always consult and read the readme or docs of a given Docker image before you're using it to be sure how you have to use it and what you need to specify. And there, within that, Automated functionality poses as one major approach to use Docker images. For example, if you have a certain pipeline or workflows, and we will look into that a bit later. But it's also possible to define tasks during initiation of a Docker container. So if we type, for example, Docker run Ubuntu, which is the same as before, right? We want to run our Ubuntu image. But now type um, after 
the image name, hello, well, echo, hello from your, oh, no, I'm sorry, can't even read my own slides, from within your container. Type that and press enter. What we get is not nothing, but hello from within your container. And while you now might think this is not super exciting at all, it's just like a plain text message, it's important to understand what's behind that. But this message, this hello from within your container is, is not coming from your machine. It's coming from another realm within your machine. It, that's the Docker run. So if we do Docker run Ubuntu, this is done on your machine. But that second part, hello from within your container, is coming from the realm of Docker that's within your Docker container. So it's not your machine that's printing this message to your terminal, but the Docker operating system that we just run. We can also work with Docker containers in an interactive fashion by including the dash IT flag or argument in our run comment. So it's Docker run dash IT and then our image name, which is Ubuntu. There's a question from someone yeah. saying, uh, from Mark saying, uh, you are uh, you are in the RD, D, uh, R2D2 uh, environment, uh, should we be as well? I think it may be good to clarify, uh, you know, this, uh, what uh, Docker versus uh, the R, uh, R2D2, just re-summarize re again, maybe. Okay, yeah, sure, good question, thank you a lot. So these virtual Python environments and Docker are completely independent from one another. They don't have nothing to do with each other. They're not interacting, as far as I know. I never had problems, I never heard about it. Because Docker is its own program running on your machine, so is Conda or virtual environments. And the reason why we have both in one now is because of your shell, of your bash. Bash is able to run both of these programs, resources, tools, but they do not interact with one another. So if you don't like R2D2, because there are such people, just deactivate it. Um, source deactivate, oh, that's kind of deactivate, I'm sorry. Um, but it won't make a difference for whatever we do with Docker. These are independent. Is that okay? an explanation yeah thank you so yeah yeah uh, it's just okay. like uh, because the yeah those i mean yeah uh, maybe showing why uh, they don't interact uh, is uh, maybe I mean, if it's not too hard uh, just explaining why maybe conda and uh, uh, conda and virtual Amp may interact because they're based on path uh, aspect uh, but uh, why uh, uh, actually uh, they won't interact if they are uh, you know separated. But uh, uh, they're, they're based on path aspect. But Docker is not based on the path aspect. It creates a whole uh, a whole environment with all the system. Yes, exactly. So yeah, um, as said before, I've never heard about Conda and Docker interfering except if you use, of course, the, um, Conda within Docker, but this is something we're gonna to touch on later. And this is just the same problem as if you were using Conda virtual end for different Python distros on your own machine, right? If you use it within a container that is its own machine again, you just get the same problems. But it's not that you have to be in a certain Python environment or virtual environment, Conda environment to use Docker or you don't need to use Docker to use these Python virtualizations, right? They can all be connected, but by default, they just run side by side and they don't interfere with one another. Okay, if we now go back to our interactive approach here. So we want to now use our Docker container within an interactive fashion, right? We wanna work with it. Therefore, we have to include the dash IT flag when running our container. So it's docker run dash IT interactively 
whatever image, Ubuntu. So if we do that, oh, why is my email popping up? I'm sorry. Um, what we see now is a change in the common prompt. So from my name at my MacBook, we go to root at cryptic letter number combination something. And very important folks, we are now inside the Docker container, inside the Docker realm. You're not on your host machine. You're not on your laptop, desktop machine, what have you anymore. You are inside the Ubuntu operating system in that Docker container. You can, for example, check that out using LS and you see the classic Linux based um, structure of an operating system which for the Unix and Mac folks is less exciting, but for the Windows people, it might be depending on how much you get excited about these things, but this is what it is. We are inside the container, its own self-contained operating system on your, its house, like it's living on your machine, but it's not your machine. This distinction is important. And we can leave this realm just by typing exit and we are back on our host machine, where when we type ls, we see whatever we should see, wherever the word directory we are. And depending on a given texture definition from so-called running instances, running. Running instances are images contained that you are currently running, that are running in the background, maybe important to keep that in mind because every image, of course, uses three, maybe this, um, maybe also um, uses some ports for your connection and what have you. When you get a notice, for example, a draw your computer is getting very loud. Um, chances are a Docker image might be running in the background and we can just use Docker PS, which is for me empty. We would see um, a container ID image, the command created status ports and names, but nothing is there right now. And the Docker force is actually so powerful that we can even do time travel by typing docker ps, but including the dash a argument. And off we go. We can use docker to actually do time travel as its force is strong enough. If we just append dash a to our docker ps command, because it will tell us, let me just make it a bit bigger here, the container ID, the image name, the exact comment when it was created, how it was it exited or what is the current status of all the images we did run in our like current Docker install and session. So if you at any point in time see um, status like running or like some ports are connected, you should close and stop these running containers, which we're gonna go on later a bit. And in order to ensure that the given container is removed from running instances after exiting, you can just include the dash dash rm flag to the docker run command. So if we type that, docker run it dash dash rm Ubuntu, it will not change this behavior. We can just exit again, but upon closing, this flag will ensure that it's removed from the running instances. So now let's go back to our main goal, right? Making the fancy detail analysis run everywhere in a reproducible manner. I mean, running for everyone in this course. And thus we descend into the Docker Force realm and create a new mission base. So with that, we're going to start with, oh, actually, let me. Let me bring it up here. We at first start with docker run dash it dash dash rm, the comment we just learned, and Ubuntu. So now we are inside 
our container again. Within our container, we make a directory named the feed and reproducibility empire. If we check ls now, you should see that new directory popping up here. Okay, now let's assume six years, 76.5 million dollars later, we managed to do it. The script runs in our container, everything is great, everything is fine. We achieve galactic reversibility piece. We exit the realm and 16 years later, as well as Nacelle to Disney, we decide to return to our container. Check LS and our folder, our directory, everything in it is gone. It disappeared from the Docker realm. Everything is lost. And the problem is when working within a Docker container, creating, modifying, and deleting files, changes are never neither permanent nor saved, as this is against the encapsulation and reversibility idea. This is will always be the case. The a given Docker image can never be changed or altered. It will forever be what it is. And furthermore, we cannot interact with data stored on our host machine or our realm and the somewhere inside the Docker container, the Docker realm. These things are living or existing in parallel with no way of interacting with one another, at least in the way we did it so far. So therefore, the stuff we could do with it is rather limited because a given image can never be altered. We cannot provide data or bring something in and out. In order to address all problems, we need to create a force bridge between the two realms, or in other words, mount paths between the host machine, your own machine, and the Docker container. And here, mounting describes a mapping from paths inside the Docker container to paths paths outside Docker container to paths inside the Docker container so that a certain path is available from your machine with inside, within the Docker container. And this is achieved through the dash V flag within the Docker run command and utilized as follows. So you would have dash V path outside container to path inside container where, again, please make sure you like replace these wildcards to your specific paths on your machine. Um, okay. I'm still, am I still there? I'm getting very anxious about this right now. Um, but I get a question to the ideals of files not be saved, so I, I think I am. Okay, so I'm just gonna continue. So to see that in action, we will create a directory called who within our Galaxy folder and make it available inside our Docker container as rebel base. So therefore we exit our container. And now we're going to create a new directory within our Galaxy directory. And we are going to CD into this directory. Oops, sorry. And this is where we should be right now. And what we need to do now to make our current working directory available inside the Docker container is again using the dash reef like mounting it. So we do docker run, dash it, dash dash rm, that's old news, and dash v. And then we are going to indicate our path, then colon, and then on the second half, whatever the name of the directory should be with inside the Ubuntu image. So 
we decided on Revel based. And then our image name again. And if we run it, we are inside our container again. If we type ls, we see our new directory rebel base. So something is there, something was created. And now to experience the uh, force bridge in action, we will create a new file inside that directory. And if everything works out as this directory inside the container is mapped to a path outside the container, that is the directory we're in here, we sh it should appear there. So if we type touch, as we learned yesterday in the bash lecture, rebel base, and then within that a file called devstarplant.png. We get an output because we just created this file. If we check the content of rebel base, we see devstarplants.png is there. And if we now exit our container, we are in the directory remounted. So if I type ls now, I should see devstarplants.png. And happy birthday, me. We did it. It worked. It's there. This is because, as again, we mounted these directories from our host machine outside the container to be available inside the container. And if we do something on either end, it's reflecting the other end because both places on your machine or like in this realm speaking manner are the identical same place. If we now want to go a bit further, it's also possible to restrict the rights of mounted paths to, for example, read only in case any modification should be rendered. For example, if you know that the non-existent reproducibility empire wants to destroy your plants, it's possible to do that by just getting your um, comment as before, and then after the mount, so after the path name, we're inside a Docker container, for us it's slash rebel base, we do a call in and type R O, which stands for read only. And if we run it, get it into root, if we check the contents of rebel base, we see our file is still there. Now we are feeling rowdy and evil and want to delete that. And it tells us we cannot remove it because it's a read-only file system. So within that mount, it's possible to specify like uh, the, the rights of these mounted paths and file systems. So if you want it to have be read-only, just append the dash row, uh, the uh, column row, which is very powerful in that thing. Most of the time, it's also very good idea to indicate absolute paths on the host system, not do like relative paths, whatever, just be sure and do it. Because sometimes relative, relative paths are not resolvable or depending on the setup, it might not work out. So just to be on the safe side, always use absolute paths. In our example, the directory rebel base um, did not exist before mounting it, right? Because before we were running it, do we still have that? No. But this was not there. And it was automatically created through our mount comment. But this is very dependent on the Docker image and its setup and definition at hand. As for example, a certain within automated functionality, a certain directory can be expected, right? Some input directory is expected to appear or be present and within that some data that should be worked on. So we have to exactly mount it as that. But this can also lead to errors. For example, if you have, if you provide the same name at an existing directory, this will be overwritten during the mount. 
So if an example, for example, a directory named rebel base was existent, would have been existent in our Ubuntu container, you would have mounted it as we did, you would have overwritten everything there is in rebel base. And this without telling us this, right? The reason is the Docker force is mighty, but also mysterious. And this is very, very important to remember. I also spent the whole afternoon figuring out why my container is not freaking working. And then I remembered I just over like I overwritten a path that was already inside. So I did not pay close enough attention to it. So for example, if you were to mount a directory called home, like something on your machine to home inside your machine, this home directory inside the machine would have been overwritten and everything in it lost in its current running instance. So always make sure, check the readme and or docs of a given Docker image, please. Um, another cool thing is you can mount as many directories and files as you want in the kitchen, each with a dash V flag. For example, you could map an input and output directory um, with regard to your mission, let's say, pre-processing, analyzing data. So, so this would look as follows. <clears throat> um, we have our comment as is, right? We are mounting our current working directory to rebel base read only. And now we want to mount another one, which is not our present working directory, but another one called Dagobah. And if we have that, we will mount that to something called X-Wing in our container. So we go and set our container. And again, check if that's possible. If it's possible to um, create these um, directories and if you should create them, how are they named, not overwriting anything, if some paths on the files are expected or if the paths are generated automatically. To summarize what we've learned so far in this section is that usually Docker images specif specific purposes, follow specific purposes and it can be automated functionality, um, but you can also use them in an interactive manner. Running instances always need to be checked and images can never be changed as they are, right? The Docker Realm and your host machine are two separate places which are not connected by default but need to be connected through um, a mapping or a mount. As said before, pull by default always pulls the latest searches and needs to specify specific text and whatnot. Um, we're gonna skip the exercise as we are way behind time. Now, what we would like to do, of course, is running our um, DTI analysis inside the Docker container because this is what we need to do. Right? This is what we're interested in. Finally getting this analysis to run on everyone's machines. So, what we need to do now within the realm of Docker, we need to make it available. And if you remember the fancy DTI analysis script is hosted within our Galaxy directory. So to make it available inside our container, we're gonna change the mount a bit. And instead of mounting the subdirectory here, we're going to mount Galaxy to rebel base and read only. Okay, so we type docker run it dash dash rm again and mount our galaxy directory to be available inside our container as rebel base and the read only file system. Ooh, one, two. <clears throat> and if we have that, we're gonna hit enter and then check that it's there. So if we type ls pointing it to rebel base, we see our directories we created before in our fancy adventures 
and the also fancy DTI analysis.py. And now, as usual, we want to run it using Python. So we type Python and then the path to our analysis. Okay. We're all excited uh, to see what's going to happen now there. <laughs> yeah, everyone, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exciting times we're living, right? So let's wait no longer and just type enter. Boom. Python is not even installed. Remember when I said before, rem the, the, the remember that frustration and anxiety and like feeling of being stressed and like frustrated Again, remember it, but don't let it corrupt you to the dark side because great new things and frontiers are waiting for us. Because after spending some time with virtualization Padawans, the Reproducibility Council entrusts us with more challenging missions. We need to expand our Docker force as we need to provide custom Docker images. We need to learn, we need to learn how to build them, right? Because as you see, like in our, as you saw in our Ubuntu image, Python is not even installed. And as you remember, we can't change a given container instance or image instance. We can never change that Ubuntu container. We need to create a new one. Um, we're having some problems with the um, uh, mounting and uh, the subsystem for Windows. Okay, so apparently, there are some limitations as Sebastian just shared a link. I am sorry, I could not, I don't have access to a Windows machine, therefore I could not test it. Um, it's weird that it's like that, but also not super weird because if you just, if you use, for example, Docker on a, in the Docker Toolbox or Quick Start, that whole path thing, where is what and how do you have to mount them and you include them is, um, it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem. For the sake of time, I'm going further. We actually don't need the script to be available inside the container for the next couple of whatever minutes we have. So um, we're just going to continue and we'll try to solve it later on so that you can actually finish the tutorials and everything um, after this lecture, maybe, if that's possible. Okay. Um, let me just make that a bit smaller here. Why is it not? Okay, so. And we enter the next chapter of our virtualization wars, which is called Docker 101, the build strikes back. We learned that the dark side is indeed very strong and we need to become masters of virtualization to tackle the empire of non-existent reproducibility that agonizes the galaxy with all that we have. And so far, we hopefully learned at the Docker Academy how Docker works, works how images can be downloaded, used, and managed. The question now is how are Docker images actually created for specific projects, pipelines, etc.? How can different programs be installed and how are locally created Docker images be shared? And when it comes to creating Docker images, there are two essential parts that are relevant. The first one is a so-called Docker file and the second one, the Docker build command. And we're going to talk about both now in this session. At the beginning, there was a Docker file, where a Docker file is a text file that contains a mixture of Docker build and bash commands. Being the focus of our currently new mission, we will create one in our directory and then open it up. So we are still in our directory, this is good. So we're gonna use touch again to touch and so far empty file, and this is called a Docker file. Right now, where you are. It's called to just a Docker file, press enter, get new output. But we should see in our um, directory, we have a new thing called Docker file. So we are now going to open that one up using VS Code or 
for the reason if you want to use something else please do so but please don't use word <laughs> this will not be a good idea um i just open it up here i got my docker file here and if i open it up i now have I change my view a bit, my setup. What you can see here is still my terminal as before, but above here is my Docker file where I can type stuff. So you can have it also in the same manner, or you just have it side by side, whatever works for you, okay? As long as this, there is a file called Docker file within this directory here, that's all good. I said before, it is empty. And now going for the old tales of building Docker images, we learned that we need to populate it beginning with the so-called base. And this corresponds to the underlying operating system we want or need to use. Given that we already worked on it, we're going to use Ubuntu. And what we need to type here is from Ubuntu as our base image or our base we want to continue and start building our own image. But just type this in, like first line, just from Ubuntu. Next, we specify that the installation of packages, programs, etc., is done non-interactively. That is, we don't have to say yes to every program that is installed. It's just getting done. And by now, I'm also just, oops, I'm sorry. Just typing that again. If you have your the uh, comments open that I shared on GitHub, you can also just copy paste that. But for the sake of practice, I just want to type it. Okay. Now we need some encoding and um, startup specific of our operating system. This is gonna be a bit more like operating system specific stuff. For example, setting our language encoding to use ETF-8 and the entry point of our operating system, that is the startup that is run when firing up our container. And this is the information we need. And now as I'm also lazy, I'm just gonna copy that. There's no... Uh, no, it's take too long. There is the build. There we go. Just, oops, that was wrong. Copy it. And paste it. Okay. And believe it or not, with that, we already have enough to build our first own Docker image. Okay, this is all we need. From Ubuntu, we set the base, set non-interactive um, debug fronted for installing packages and whatnot, set our language encoding, our entry point. We save this image. And everything we need to do now is use the second point or important part of Docker images, creating them is the build command. So we use the syntax or the build command docker build dash t, provide an image name and our docker file where image name provides a name for our to be built image via the dash t or tag flag. And the docker file is the path to wherever our docker file can be found in the galaxy. For our example, we're gonna use docker build dash t and millennium falcon and as the docker file is in the directory we are currently in we're just going to use a dot because this indicates current working directory present working directory and if we have that and hit enter We're gonna see some warnings here. That's okay, warnings are usually fine, pretty sure. And then what we see again is, in a stepwise manner, our image is created. 
starting from Ubuntu, setting this um, non-interactive front end, language encoding, and this corresponds to the layers we're talking about. These are the different steps we're going to need to include and run to create the image we are interested in. And if we see, or if you see that line successfully tagged Millennium Falcon dot late, uh, colon latest, then this means our, your own first ever own Docker image was built already with just that. And we can ensure that by typing Docker images and we see, here we go. We have hello world, our Ubuntu image worked before and the Millennium Falcon image we just created. And as you can see, we started from Ubuntu as the base and specified these further set settings, not including like a lot of stuff. And therefore, it's the same size, very small. Whoops, sorry. And why is it so powerful? Why is it so fast? And here you must remember, images can never be changed. To build a new one, we need, in case like we need functionality or missing whatever, we need to adapt existing ones. And for our comment uh, from Ubuntu, we are starting from an image to create a new image, as said before, that Ubuntu from Ubuntu is the base we are setting. And then we are going further. And the shared layers between our images, because we're not including anything else, right? It's just setting language encoding. Um, it's super fast because it just reuses everything that's there from Ubuntu, writing it with a new name, setting the language, um, the encoding and variables, and then we're good. And I also said before, and as you can see, the image in itself is really limited in what it can do. It doesn't really matter, right? It's just the Ubuntu image as before, meaning we don't also don't have Python and everything. So let's install some other useful packages and programs. In most Linux operating systems, this is done through the apt-get command. And we go with some essentials here. That is um, apt-utils, CI certificates, Git, of course, because we now know Git is super essential and we need that, and something else. And also just copy-pasting that right now from our commands.sh, and if we have that, um, it's basically from this point in time onwards, just following the, uh, the creation of Docker containers follows um, any Linux distribution using apt-get or setting environment variables. It's like very comparable, maybe a bit adapted to the Docker specific comments, but it's uh, very easy. Um, and now that we have also these new things included, we're just gonna rebuild our image, providing with the same name, right? We're gonna stick with Millennium Falcon because it's cool. And we have that again, press enter. And then as you can see, it's going super fast to this point because it can actually use the layer that are already there. So therefore it doesn't need to install anything new. It just needs to update and install everything that's here from where the images diverge in their setup. Now it's taking a bit longer, but not super long. And we now again see our tag, our line, Millennium Falcon latest successfully tagged. And if we use Docker images again to check what's going on. We see again, we have our free images, hello world, Ubuntu, Millennium Falcon, but it now went from 73.9 megabytes to 206 megabytes, just by including these add-ons here, right? Still very small for an entire operating system. I think we can all agree on that. 
And as I said before, this is because of the layer principle, which comes so right again. We don't need to pull layers and components of an operating system we already have, but only those are needed to build an entirely new one or to create the new one we are specifying, let's say that. While this already seems like an overkill and very complex for you, I, I, I completely understand. Like if you're not familiar with working with these things, this looks like I have no idea what's going on and oh my God. But keep in mind, this is a very basic image. And the fitting compilation of an entire Docker file for a complex script pipeline analysis appears to be very convoluted and prone to errors, as well as take a lot of time in searching throughout the galaxy, especially in the beginning, if you're not familiar with it. So through the forest, we can actually see also in the future, and this prophecy we just talked about was right, the Docker files, that in the Docker file we need to enable our fancy DDI analysis is indeed tremendously complicated. So we're using the forest going into the future, and this is the Docker file we need in the end to create our image and run our analysis. As you can see, incredibly complex, lots of lines of codes. No one wants to do that. It's lots of errors, copy pasting, typing, screaming. That's not, no one, no one likes that. So you might wonder, isn't there a more sufficient, faster, and easier way of using the Docker force? Well, say no more, because there is a thing called NeuroDocker, which is a Docker image that targets the creation of Docker images. That is right. It is Dockerception, because someone already thought about it, created a nice software for you that keeps track of it and handles it for you. So let's check how we can create Docker files using NeuroDocker. And if you got lost here, we're using NeuroDocker now to ease up the creation of our Docker files. So we don't have to do all of this writing that by hand, making lots of errors and searching and whatnot, okay? At first, we need to get the NeuroDocker image. Or the NeuroDocker Docker image. Yeah, let's say that. And we're going to type docker pull. We already know that, right? That's our command to pull images. And type the docker id tag neuro docker. And then what you can see here, we're using a specific tag, not just using latest as it would be like that, but using a specific tag or version, which is 0.4.3. And you can just copy paste it or write it. Just gonna wait a few more seconds. And once you have that, you hit enter. And again, we see a specific version is pulled. We got our layers gonna be downloaded. Depending on size, it takes a while, gonna be extracted and generated and we have our newer image ready to use. And if you want to be sure, you can always type Docker images and we now have our NeuroDocker container available and ready to use. Okay, so after checking the readme and docs of NeuroDocker, which I already did for you, we know that we need to run NeuroDocker providing necessary import arguments, beginning with stating that we want to create a Docker image and that we want to use Docker as the base. So we're just gonna type that in. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, Docker run, the name of our Docker image. then provide our arguments telling NeuroDocker that we want to generate a Docker image and that our base should be Ubuntu. Okay. 
we also um, need to indicate that we want to use app as a pack manager and furthermore specifying the packages to install. So we're going to state our package manager. Oops, I'm sorry. Should be apt as we did before. Here we just wrote it down. Here we're just going to tell it near Docker like so. And we want to install git nano and unzip. And once we have that, we're going to hit enter. And what we see is um, the output is the content of our Docker file. That is, if we run it, sorry, starting from here, okay, to get everyone on track, we run the Docker command using NeuroDocker, telling it to create a Docker. Once we want to generate a Docker image, use Ubuntu as the base, as apt as the package manager, and install git nano and unzip. And everything that follows that is here, that's the output of NeuroDocker. The purpose it has is creating these Docker files. So we can now use this to build our Docker image. See, like everything we wrote before manually is written for us from like through NeuroDocker, right? We don't have to type it in, it automatically gets us there. Unfortunately, so far, the Docker image is not automatically created for NeuroDocker. It writes the Docker file for you. Thus, what we need to do to make um, the most out of it, or to actually use it in a proper way, is we use our Docker run comment and then just force the output to our Docker file. So everything that's written through NeuroDocker is parsed into our Docker file we created before and populated by hand manually, super annoyingly. And if we have that and enter that, then this file is automatically populated through NeuroDocker. See, this is the same Docker file as before, but everything in here was written by NeuroDocker. And I think neither of us, neither me nor you, would have been up for typing all of these things because it's just, it's a lot and it's just the beginning. And that's um, all we need actually to create our image from before, except saving the stress and work of writing manually. The force is indeed very strong in your Docker and makes our reputable life super easy. Because we also need that we, uh, we also know that we need to include a Python distribution to run our fancy analysis, preferably one we use in our Conda virtualization. Because we know that for a lot of us, the thing, the, the Python virtual, the, the Conda virtualization, the environment we had during this part of the lecture worked, right? For some people don't, but for most of us. So we want to recreate that environment, right? We need to have. Python 3.7, DiPy, and Fury. And creating this environment again within our Docker image, that is within our Docker image, we then have also the Python virtualization, bringing both virtualization types together. Using NeuroDocker is very easy. This is our comment from before. And as you see here, right? And everything we need to type now is dash dash, oops, I'm sorry, mini conda, because we want to use mini conda. Conda install, we want to use conda to install certain Python related resources. This is going to be Python 3.7 and DiPy. We know that Fury needs to be installed via pip, so we indicate that pip install. Fury. We want to create an environment with that that is called R2D2. And we want to activate that environment 
upon starting our container. Bear, I think you missed the good at after three. After what? Fury. What, what is? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was a crazy, nasty arrow. Thank you for catching that. Um, okay. So, as said before, we are now like bringing both virtualization types together. We start off with our, we actually like start from the end right now, right? We create a Docker image. And within that Docker image, we create a Python, virtualized Python environment, a Conda environment, where our steps are comparably to what we did before in the Conda session. We want to have Conda using, we want to use mini Conda to get Python 3.7, that specific distribution. And we want to install DiPy using Conda. We know that we need to install Fury using pip. We want our environment to be called R2D2, and we want to activate it. And instead of running that like manually step after step, we can include everything at once in our neurodocker command, crossing it to our Docker file. And then this is once again updated, as we can see here, and now includes all these conda specific comments that are neat needed to create this environment in our container. And again, I'm pretty sure none of you would have loved to type that down manually because just think about the errors. So many typing errors, right? And your Docker draws it for you. As I said before, we have efficiently combined the two virtualization approaches and we can rebuild it. Now, if we start rebuilding the container as it is, we can start it now. Docker build dash T Millennium Falcon and the dot. Yes, I've seen questions appearing in my periphery. Why is it not working? And yeah, you need to write that dot at the end or need to provide the absolute path to the Docker file. One of the two, right? Because otherwise you will get an error saying there's no, there's a missing argument. So now if we have that, and if I hit enter, you can all do that, but it will take a while now. So we go through everything that it was there before, right? Every, all the layers are there, except the Python specific layers. And this is done um, now in our new image. As this will take a while, as it's downloading mini Conda and like the packages, it might take a while to build. And we're also way over time, and this might be a good, um, stopping point actually so i can summarize some things and provide some pointer um so that you all can start your assignments on time i'm sorry that we did not manage to get through all of there is we got super far i think and as gp said it's a lot of stuff um the slides again will be available once we incorporate your feedback, make things clearer, add explanations and whatnot, the visualization commands and the Docker file, I can all, I can, this will all be shared. Don't worry. And if you do that and go through the materials later on, you can go on, like go through the whole tutorial and the other parts of the lecture that we now not be able to do. Actually, so don't actually, worry yeah. about that. Bear, do you think do you think you could just push uh, the PDF of the slides in the uh, course material? Uh, uh, repository uh, right now, so that you know, like, uh, uh, people who may, may need to come back to something during the assi assignment uh, will be able to actually, you know, blah, blah, blah. the assignment is not meant to be, you know, like you, you, you are, you should have your like, uh, you know, uh, uh, resources uh, available. So if you could, if you could just push this, uh, uh, this PDF, that'd be great uh, in in the repo. And, and then the PDF you will be will be updated later on with the uh, uh, the corrections or the uh, embellishment um, uh, that are suggested. Yeah. Okay. Like okay. After my summary, I will yeah. download it as the PDF and upload it. 
Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we will take a 10 minutes break. Don't worry, you will have like a, <laughs> enough time. To, okay. uh, yeah, thank yep. you. Okay, so I'm just now going through the slides. Please ignore everything you see. Uh, there are some nice problems we need to tackle and some nice pointers. Do, 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 do. And at some point it will work for you. Don't worry. Then we talk about how to push it. That's, you can all do all of that um, later on. What you must remember is that Docker build and push is everything you need for creating your own images and make them available. They can be very complex, very quick. You can combine Python and container virtualization and you should do that. You can to use tools like NeuroDocker to create these files for you. Um, you know, um, and what you also should do is um, keep in mind that Docker files or Docker file creation follows the same rules as Linux-based um, operating system installations. You have to just swallow that big pill that is a steep learning curve when it comes to these things, right? Creating Docker images, building them, like as with Python and everything else. But let me tell you, I usually get the question, do I really need that? Is that, rare, is that, is that actually is it necessary? And I would say that the amount of time you need to get a good understanding, a good grasp of what's going on with these tools and how to use them is nothing in comparison what you, the amount of time you will save through them. Just being able to rerun an entire analysis or just the pure peace of mind knowing that it will run in that container no matter what and you can take that container somewhere else and share it with people that's 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 very nice that's very powerful and if possible you should always share your images like for example like for a publication and whatnot you can have a specific image you run your analysis in you can upload that and name and tag your image in the best way possible some important times and uh, points in general, these things take time, especially in the beginning. And no one expects you to create virtual environments or build containers all day after this three and a half hour lecture, especially as we did not get through all of it. The examples within this lecture were picked to showcase different important aspects of virtualization. There are many more. You will run into different errors and different problems, but the internet is full of very helpful resources and good communities that will be able to provide help. Building the right and fitting environment is most likely going to be a trial and error process with some things going to be comparable, copy pasteable, for example, the base image, the Python environment, uh, encodings, and others will require more work and searching through the internet. And what I would, oh, I think what also the others would suggest to you is that you should start using virtualization for different aspects of your scientific workflow and get to know the benefits along the way, right? Start, if you start a new project, why not start it in a virtualized environment, in a container and do everything in there to be sure, no matter what happens, as long as the internet exists or that machine, that image, you're good. And what, follows later on is um, some advanced concepts that is how you set up automated builds for github and include automated functionalities of containers so for example in our case how we change our container to automatically run our analysis and this you can go through um, later on if you want because this is as said here it's advanced concepts right and if you know that you're pretty much up there. Um, and with that, sorry, it's a lot of slides. Yeah, so no matter if you went on a selfish dog path of basically non-existent reproducibility and want to join the light side now, or if you always were on the light side of force, using it for the greater good, um, it's important, I think, that you try these tools out and just play around with it. We are here for the whole brain X school duration. We are in the Slack. If you have specific questions about it, let me know. Um, I'm happy to answer them. And the singularity related nodes, it's also in there. You can go through them in preparation for tomorrow's uh, lecture on Compute Canada by Felix, but he will also mention all of that. So that's um, all good. 
and I also include some further readings for you if you're interested in some other tutorials. If you're not super annoyed by me and my resources and whatever, there's also a full day Docker workshop that goes way more into depth. You can do that. We have like some other smaller intros. We got a, a Zotero group with some nice um, publications that show the application of Docker and containers in neuroscience research. So you can go through all of that. And with that, I'm done. I would like to thank all of you for your attention, for your interesting questions. And if everything is left open, which I guess there is, just let me know. Thank you so much, Per. That was, again, so much information, so little time. Uh, and I think uh, you balanced very well the sort of the practical aspect and the, uh, the conceptual aspect. So that's, uh, that, that was absolutely awesome. Thanks uh, so much. Uh, do you think you could just run that uh, uh, DiPy little thing in the? I, I see that the build has been done. If uh, if you if that could be run in uh, thirty seconds to show people what uh, this uh, .py uh, analysis was doing, uh, uh, please do it now. If uh, if you think that is going to take like a, a bit of time, just uh, well, let's uh, skip it. Um, I'm currently converting the slides to PDF and share it and it's also okay. gonna uh, take a while so yeah what you should get out in the end is basically um like free uh the graphics showing you um different outputs of a dti analysis with the final one being um a connector like tractography of the corpus callosum so if you like follow the steps you should be able to run it and i think like for most of us it already worked even okay. without docker